A few months back, we had a Christmas program here at our church that has now become infamous in our household. <laughs> you that are laughing, you know where I'm going with this. And so uh, for those that were not here, we have Christmas Eve fell on a Sunday. The Sunday before that, we usually do a uh, musical presentation that involves our adult choir and uh, our kids' choir. And so this year, our oldest son, David, was finally old enough to participate in this. And I use that air quotes intentionally because part of the service, we, they sing a song, and then I gathered all the kids to sit right here uh, as I taught a, a kid's message that was for everybody. And it, it, the, the, all of the kids are sitting down listening respectfully to me. And one kid named David Dixon decided he was not going to do that. And so he goes behind me to this manger scene and grabs the star and starts hitting me over the head repeatedly with it. Meanwhile, Stephanie, our kids minister, like a ninja, slips on stage and is fighting him, trying to pull it from him. And then he starts, I think he confused the role of a shepherd with the Sanhedrin because he started beating baby Jesus repeatedly on camera. And so, you know, meanwhile, Liz is on the front row levitating. I mean, she's just like shooting laser beams, smoke coming out of her ears. And the worst part about it is I had no idea this was happening. I mean, literally, I am clueless. And so I walk off stage and I'm thinking it's the Christmas season, it's the Christmas spirit, and she's mad looking like she got coal for Christmas. And I'm like, what happened? And she proceeds to tell me and I was like, oh man. That's not good. And so one of the things we're trying to do with him is we're trying to help him understand cause and effect. And so we gathered him that evening in our household and started saying, David, like, what were you thinking? Like, what, like what, what led you to believe that this was an okay decision? I mean, literally every other boy and girl was sitting respectfully in front of dad listening, and you're the only one who's making a scene, right? And so we asked him that. We said, buddy, like seriously, will you tell us what you were thinking? And he said, mommy and daddy, my brain told me it was a good idea. <laughs> to which Liz immediately said, well, next time that happens, tell your brain to be quiet and sit down. <laughs> Not a good idea. And as I think about that story, and I think his response, although it's funny, there's a profound truth in that, isn't there? that our brains and our minds have a powerful effect on our life, don't they? That our thoughts determine our actions and our actions determine the course of our life. What's crazy is the human mind thinks up to 60,000 thoughts a day, some studies show. 60,000 thoughts a day, and then up to 90% of those thoughts are repetitive, and here's the scary part, up to 75% of our thoughts are negative. So that means roughly 45,000 thoughts a day on a continuous cycle, if you will, are negative. It's crazy, isn't it? Ralph Waldo Emerson said it this way, you become what you think about all day long. I think many times we don't think about what we think about, do we? We just kind of let it go, and the reality is if we want to live the lives that God's called us to live, we have to actually think about what we think about. We've been in this series called Questions Jesus Asked, and today I want to direct your attention to a question that Jesus asked about thought life. In Mark chapter 2, Verses six through eight, Jesus is talking to the religious leaders and this is what he says. He says, now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow, meaning Jesus, talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And then it says, immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? things. In Matthew 9, 4, we see Matthew's gospel accounts it this way. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? So today, I want to unpack that question. I want to, to seek to address why is it that we think negative or evil thoughts? And I'm going to kind of give you the, the whole cr like crux of the message right from the onset. So really, we're going to look at two different things. We're going to look at where do these thoughts come from? 
Like what's the source of these evil thoughts or, or negative thoughts or, or bad thoughts, if you will, and then how do we overcome them? So really that's the whole, the two points right there in the message. If you check out, it's, you've already got it. Where do they come from? And then how do we overcome them? And here's what we have to understand though. How many of you have ever heard of the self-help movement? We probably all heard that. How many of you know that following Jesus is not the self-help movement? That if self is the problem, self can't be the solution, amen? So if we are sinful in ourselves, then the solution is not found in ourselves. So the self-help movement says you can do it. You can overcome. But Christianity says we, you and I, we can't, but Jesus can and Jesus did overcome. So only by the power of Jesus can we overcome this all important and difficult battle with our thought life. And as we invite him into our life, what happens is he will start to change our thoughts. And as our thoughts align with his thoughts, guess what happens? Your thoughts have the power to change your life, Rod Willingham said. I like the way Proverbs 4.23 in the Good News Translation says, it says, be careful how you think. Y'all say, be careful. Be Be careful how you think. Why? Because your life is shaped by your thoughts. So my hope at the end of our time together today is we're going to have a better grasp on how we can help affect the direction of our life simply by managing our thought life. Now, we're gonna be looking at a lot of different scripture today. Truthfully, my preference is to usually camp out on one passage, but there is a lot in the Bible about thought life. And so we're gonna bounce around so it may be easier for you to follow along on the screens today. Before we look at a couple of passages, I wanna give you the main idea for today. If you've got a listener guide, I would encourage you to jot this down. If you don't have a listener guide, take mental notes. If you got it, say got it. Here we go. We become what we think about the most. The only way to find victory in our thought life is by the power of Jesus. How many of you know that Jesus is the only way? to find victory in our thought life. And by understand, so not only through Jesus, but then we also have to understand the enemy's plan of attack. Because newsflash, in case we did not know that, the enemy has a plan for your life and a plan for my life. God has a plan for our life and the enemy has a plan for our life. The enemy's plan is to, to destroy our life, but God wants to bless our life and enrich our life, and so we have to align ourselves with the Lord. Now, how, how do we manage our thought life? Well, first thing we gotta understand is where do these negative and evil thoughts come from? Really, I wanna talk about three different places that they come from. The first one is perhaps obvious, but maybe not so obvious, and that is from sin and Satan. Y'all say sin. So that means to miss the mark. And we see this all the way back in the very beginning. When God created everything, things were perfect. He was in perfect relationship with Adam and Eve. And, and God said, hey, you can eat from any tree in the garden except for one tree. And he said, the reason why is I, I have a plan for you. I don't want you to eat from this tree. And so the enemy slips in in Genesis chapter three, verse one. And he says this to, to Eve, that now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Does that sound familiar? Sounds like the lies he whispers us does. Did God really say you have to be kind to other people when they're not kind to you? Did God really say, insert difficult thing here? You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when Satan whispered these lies to Adam and Eve, they chose to go against God's plan. And when they chose to go against God's plan, sin entered into the world. And when that happened, it fractured our relationship with God. You see, a lot of people have this idea that if we put our good deeds and our bad deeds on a scale, as long as our good deeds outweigh our bad deeds, then God will let us into heaven. And it's understandable because the rest of our world works that way. You work hard, you get a good job, you get a good job, you make good money, so on, you on a good vacation, so on and so forth. But the reality is scripture tells us that even one sin is too much for a God who's perfect and holy and righteous. And here's the bigger problem. We're all born into sin. 
Because Adam and Eve sinned, we inherited that sin from them. Romans 5.12 says it this way. Therefore, just as sin entered into the world, we'll have it here on the screen. We do not have it here on the screen. Therefore, just as sin entered into the world through one man and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people because all sin. What does that mean? We are born into sin. If we doubt that, I've got a four-year-old you can borrow any time. And he will show you how naturally sin comes. We have to teach and to train him how to do what's right. It's the truth for all of us, that, that, that we're all prone to sin. So when sin entered into the world, humans became inherently sinful, and therefore we inherently think sinful thoughts. And the enemy knows this, and he wants to leverage this in my life and in your life. Because see, the second we start to think that the enemy is kind of this neutral thing that we don't want to think about, I want you to remember 1 Peter 5, 8. It says, be alert and of sober mind, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Does that sound like a neutral party to you? He wants to destroy our lives, and if he can't destroy our lives, then the best he'll do is distract us. So we're born into sin, and our minds are sinful, but also our hearts are sinful. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, follow your heart? Don't do that. Don't do that. You know why? Jeremiah 17, 9 says it this way, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? There was an inherent understanding in ancient times of the connection between the mind and the heart. So when they say that the heart is deceitful, that meant that the mind is deceitful. And if the mind is deceitful, the heart is deceitful. So those two things are intrinsically connected. Now, you might be wondering, well, well, what about when we give our life to Jesus? Like, doesn't he help us? Yes, he does. But how many of you know that just because we give our life to Jesus doesn't mean that our natural propensity towards sin stops? And if we doubt this, there's this guy named the Apostle Paul who like wrote a few books of the Bible. And I wanna show you what he said in Romans 7. This is like, I mean, this guy is a lot of scripture that he wrote. And he says this in Romans 7. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what's right, but I don't do it. And then he says, instead, I do what I hate. So I'm not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me. That is my sinful nature. I want to do what's right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. Does that sound like some of us, all of us at some points in our life? How many of y'all have done something where someone does something to you and you just respond rudely and you're like, God, why did I do that again? We all struggle with it. And it all starts where? Right here. It starts between our ears. You see, sinful thoughts always precede sinful actions. And if we can't have victory here, then we can't have victory in other areas of our life. And we've got to understand the enemy and how he works in our life. One of my good friends is a guy named Sam Kelly. And he is one of the pastors at Fellowship Church in Dallas. And his older brother, Josh, serves at their home church in Virginia. So they were both born in Australia, and their father uh, moved here 25 years ago to plant a church in Virginia. And so Josh was preaching at his home church the other day, and he proceeded to tell a story, and he said, I have a confession to make. And I was like, oh boy, here we go. So he, he proceeded to tell the church as an illustration that when he travels, if his boarding group is boarding group Z, now I know that Z doesn't exist, but let's just pretend that it does. He says, I, I gotta be honest. When they call boarding group A, I go right on up there every single time. Now he says, I let the military and those who need assistance, the kids, he said, I let them go. But he said, it does not matter what boarding group I'm in. I could be number Z99, and when they say A1, I'm going right on up there. And he said, you know what? The crazy thing is, the majority of the time, he walks right onto the plane. He said, you know why? Because they don't check. And as I thought about that, 
I think that's true of how the enemy works in our life, isn't it? That a lot of times we just let the enemy cut right into our life and into our mind because we don't check the thoughts that we're thinking. We have to check. We have to say, no, no. Not, any of y'all heard the phrase, not today, Satan? Anybody ever heard that? That's what we have to live our lives like. So when we think those thoughts that are not God honoring, we have to ask Jesus to help us overcome those sinful thoughts. The second area that they come from, and this is the more difficult one, is trials and trauma. Trials and trauma. So many times the negative thought patterns that we struggle with are not just a result of our sin that we commit, but rather it is a result of sin that was committed against us. Now, this can be incredibly difficult. And let me encourage you, if you find yourself in that situation today, first of all, I want you to know that God loves you and that he has a plan for you and that God can bring healing in your life. Dr. Gregory Jantz, who's a psychologist, psychiatrist, he said it this way, many years ago, when I founded a treatment clinic, I didn't fully understand that most ailments and afflictions that people deal with can be traced back to a trauma of some kind. So most difficulties that people suffer, it's from something that happened in their life. And studies will prove this because there's this scientific phenomenon, I guess you could call it, it's a psychological issue that is called the negativity bias. And what that means is that the human brain is naturally more inclined. If you take events of the same magnitude and one that is negative and one that is positive and put them side by side, our minds tend to remember the negative far more easy than the events that are positive. There's a psychologist named John Cacioppo, I think is how you pronounce his name. And what he did was he gathered a group of people to measure this and they hooked up like, things to their brain, sounds like Frankenstein, right? Like they hooked up things to their brain and they measured the cerebral cortex and what they did was they showed positive images, they showed neutral images, and then they showed negative images and they found that when they showed the negative images, their cerebral cortex lit up like the 4th of July. So it proves that our brain naturally tends to remember negative things. Now, that's bad news, but here's the good news. Our God's a healer. Our God is a healer. Psalm 34, 18 says it this way, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those whose spirits are crushed. If you're feeling that way today, can I encourage you that even though the things that maybe you've gone through are difficult and unimaginable, I wanna encourage you that God is near to you. He's available to you. And he wants to walk with you. But many times in my life, and I'm sure in your life, we keep God out of our pain. And God is saying, I want to be in every area of your life. And what I found is when people do that, what happens is God can take even the trauma and bring some level of triumph from it. Time Magazine did a study, and they found this guy named Jim Rendon said it this way. Studies have found that more than half of all trauma survivors report positive change. So even though they would probably never choose the trauma that they've gone through, it has eventually brought positive change in their life. And then this Dr. Gregory Jantz, who I quoted earlier, said it this way, trauma leaves scars that will never completely go away, but you can have a fuller, richer life because of your experiences. Working through trauma and repairing the damage will be one of the hardest things you'll do in life. You'll need to invest yourself in the process of healing, which itself is challenging and painful. But then he says the prize will be the kind of life you've longed for with close relationships, inner peace, and the energy to pursue your dreams. The only way as Jesus followers, we can experience that kind of life is leaning into him through the difficulties that we go through. So it's sin and Satan, it's trials and trauma, but then finally, the third source, I would argue, and there's probably more, but I wanna boil it down to these three, are patterns and practices. Patterns and practices, what does that mean? Well, sometimes a negative or a poor thought life is simply just the result of poor practice. How many of y'all have heard the phrase, practice makes perfect? It's wrong. At least my coaches told me that. 
the correct phrase is perfect practice makes perfect, right? And the same thing is true with our thought life. If we want to think godly thoughts, then we have to make that a priority to think godly thoughts. And there's a science behind this. There, in our brain, there are these neuropathways. And what happens is when we think a thought, it starts to create a rut. So if it were to downpour rain outside and y'all were to walk to your cars out here in the parking lot, it kind of gets a little gravelly out here. If you were to walk back and forth in that same spot, what would happen? A rut would create, right? And the same thing happens in our brain. The more we think a thought, the more of a rut it creates, and therefore it becomes even harder to get out of that rut. And so the only way to get out of that rut is to think new thoughts. And what's even more crazy is there is, scientists have studied the brain and they found a series of interlinked regions of the brain called the default mode network. And really, the, the best way I could describe this is basically when your brain goes on autopilot, if you will, I think most of us, I, I at times kind of can tend to live there. You know, you kind of just daze off. What happens is your brain tends to default to negative things. As we established earlier, we tend to remember negative things. And specifically, they find that this default mode network is activated most often when we don't have a positive external thing to focus our mind on. Anybody ever heard of idle time is the devil's playground? This is why it's so important to have something positive. That could be your job. It could be serving your spouse. It could be serving your kids. It could be parent or kids serving your parents. It could be serving at church. We need to have something positive to focus our hands and our minds on. Having a positive task to focus on helps combat negative thought patterns. And when I think about that truth, I'm reminded of Romans 12, 21, which says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Do we have those things in our life that we're focusing on? And then finally, this, this next thing that, that affects our patterns and practices, and this is perhaps the biggest one, it's what we watch and what we listen to. What we watch and what we listen to. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should only watch The Chosen, okay? I mean, if you love The Chosen, more power to you. But I'm not saying that we should only watch Christian shows. My parents had a really strict guideline on what we could or couldn't watch. I'm pretty sure when The Simpsons came out, they thought that the devil was living in the TV. I mean, just, they were like, oh my goodness, we're just showing R-rated shows on TV now, right? And it's, it's good to have guidelines, but what we watch most consistently affects our thought patterns. And so if we watch or we listen to garbage, we can probably expect to think about garbage, right? Or maybe you heard it said this way, garbage in, garbage out, right? Are we committed to filling our mind with godly things? Now, that doesn't mean it's only veggie tales. I get it. Sometimes there's, a, there's something fun about watching a sci-fi show or a murder mystery, but if you find yourself like constantly anxious and constantly worried and constantly battling these, these uh, doom and gloom type thoughts, then maybe we need to look back and evaluate what it is we're putting into our minds. Now, that's the sources of them. I wanna quickly talk through how we manage or overcome negative thoughts. The first one is this. Establish what type of thoughts that you struggle with. We all have different propensities. Perhaps yours is pride. Perhaps it's fear. Perhaps it's anxiety. Perhaps it's lust. Perhaps it's selfishness. Perhaps it's jealousy. In this amazing area we live in, Dripping Springs, it can be easy to go, oh, that's nice. Oh, that's nice. And we tend to start envying and being jealous of our neighbor. And so if we don't first establish what it is we struggle with, we can't have victory over that thing with which we struggle. Psalm 139 says it this way, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Do we spend time asking God to search us and say, Lord, Help me to identify 
those thoughts that I struggle with. And then as we identify them, the next one is perhaps just as important, and you've probably heard this before, take every thought captive. Take it captive. Where does that come from? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, Paul says this, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive. Y'all say take captive. Every thought to make it obedient to Christ. What does that mean? When a, when a thought that is not of God comes in our mind, we say, whoa, whoa, time out. Zach Morris, time out. No one watched Saved by the Bell growing up. Perfect. <laughs> got like two people that got that. Time out, and we, we say, okay, is this of God or is this of the enemy? And if it's not of God or if, if it's of the enemy, then we make it obedient to what Jesus says. Next thing, ask Jesus to transform your mind. Ask him to transform your mind. Romans 12, 2 says it this way. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The key word in that verse there to me, it's the word renewing. And that, ver that word there tells me that it's not just a one-time thing. It's a daily thing. I have to wake up every day and say, Lord, renew my mind and help me to fix my mind on what you want me to think about. How do we do this? Set your mind on things above. How many times when we think about the craziness of our world, do we start going down the, the spiraling of out of control? How crazy the wars are, how crazy things feel like they are in the world we live in. It's so easy to become consumed with the here and now, but we have to fix our mind on things above. Paul says this in Colossians 3, verse two, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. So do we fix our mind on things above or are we focused on what's here and now? And here's another thing that I found is incredibly helpful because it's one thing to think about things above, but we all tend to struggle with those things that we wanna call ourselves, that the enemy calls us. You're unworthy, you're unloved, you, you don't have a great plan, you're a bad mom, you're a bad dad, you're a bad employee. You're bad. We all have those thoughts that creep into our mind. And so here's something that I would encourage you to do. Write down what God says about you. Write down what God says about you. That could be on a sticky note. It could be taking a dry erase marker and writing it on your mirror. There is great power in writing down the truth of what God says about you. In Deuteronomy, we're told about the importance of writing things down. This was specifically speaking about God's commandments, but I want you to notice the emphasis on how important it was to write it down. Skip down to verse nine. It says, write them on, he's spe speaking about the door frames, impress them upon your children, tie them up as symbols on your hands, and it says, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Studies show that we will remember something 40% better or meaning there's a 40% greater chance we will remember something if we write it down, if we write it down. So if we wanna remember what God says about us, we should practice writing it down. And then finally, think about what God calls you and what he calls you to. First Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of his darkness into his wonderful light. There are many days that my thought life doesn't look like that. We tend to buy into what the enemy says. And I like the way that Paul says in Philippians 4, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, then what does he say? Think about such things things. If we want to think what God says about us, we have to make sure we're pouring those thoughts into our life. I'll close with this illustration. If these ping pong balls here are supposed to represent the negative thoughts that we all struggle with. There's a couple of ways I could remove those thoughts. And one of them would be probably the more painful way. And it would be to try to stick my hand in there and pull them out one by one. And I'm having trouble even reaching down and getting them in there. And so that would be kind of something that is focused on self. Like if I just try harder, if I do better, 
then I can do it. That would probably be a self-help way of doing it. But what scripture says is if this is supposed to represent what God says about us, the more that we pour that into our life, what happens? It starts to fill up and fill up and fill up. And even when we run out, we need to renew our minds every single day so that as we fill up what, what God says about us, the more we pour that into our life, the more that that will eventually flow out and remove the negative thoughts from my life and your life. Do we pour what God says in every day? Do we renew our minds every single day? The more that we pour what God says into our life, as we pour what God says in, what happens? It helps take out what the enemy says about us. Commit today to put what God says in your life and you'll find yourself thinking a whole lot less negative thoughts in your life. Hey, thanks for watching the Canyon Church YouTube channel. And we hope the message you just watched encourages your faith and helps you to follow Jesus more closely. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, we want to share with you how you can do that. If you text the word decide to the number that's gonna be on your screen, someone from our team is gonna follow up with you and help answer any questions you might have about following Jesus. Also want you to know thank you so much for your support of our church, both for our church family and our extended family. The only way we can bring messages like the one you just watched is through your generosity. If you would like to support the work that God is doing through our ministry, you can go to sunsetcanyonchurch.org and click on the button that says give. We hope you have a great week. We pray that God continues to work in your life in the days to come.